So I think we're pretty fine with eventually consistent. Sure. What's the what's the performance that you're getting? The I don't really remember the numbers, but we're talking about in the orders of tens of milliseconds to get to a five. And but normally normally when you try when you get to a file weeks you go to a CDN and you get a file from the CDN. And no, normally uh, what will happen is that when you create a site, the next thing that people do, strangely, don't know why, but the next thing that they do after creating the site is give it, they view the site. So once they view the site, all of the images and stuff are in CDN. So when the visitor comes to the site, it it's will get all the everything from the CDN. Mm -hmm. Or at least it will be in one site in the CDN. It doesn't have to be in all sites on the CDN. Mm -hmm. But again, it's the ratio of its in the CDN. The cache its in the CDN is over 95. I think it's 99% or something like that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's phenomenal. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I guess that that also kind of very good for mobile websites where the image size is important. So it's kind of optimized for mobile device, for mobile devices as well because I guess there the, the image size and all that stuff becomes even more relevant. It's relevant both in in web and in mobile. No? When in before you had Wix, when you built a website, you had this lo lo lot of HTML stuff, and then you had one two pictures. That's it. Sure. And those sites looked like you know traditional websites. They look good. And when you, when you had a designer, he would create you a flash swath that has all the images and stuff inside of it, and that would be a large bundle that you would download. And this yeah, large bundle would include a lot, lot of media. In it. And so if you wanted to be sophisticated, you would put that bundle in the CDN that would work fast for for the client. Mm -hmm. But you would pay that designer something like five thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars create that Flash sure. application. What we've done in Wix, we've created the same experience. So we have a Wix Flash application, and all the media, we downloaded a separate request, but we get the same, same amount of media. Mm -hmm. So we get a very good exper user experience, we get fast upload times, because we're in CDNs and all, all different accelerations methods, and you get the same experience. Now, of course, when we've built our mobile product, we Basically, we had the solution in place, because that, that's the way you want to go to a mobile solution. Because in mobiles, you have the bandwidth is very important. And normally, the, way, the download speed is not that good as to be in a web. Then you need to optimize what you're doing with your pictures, your media, for a mobile site. And actually, what we found is that you would actually create a different site for mobile. You would not try to create a site that looks exactly the same, okay. because the form factor is different, the human interaction with the site is different, the amount of media that people expect from a mobile site is different. So you would create a different site. Will have lot. It will have less media. It will have more text. It will be more column based. It will have a simpler layout. Sure. And so the question of actually having a picture and having it resized for a mobile device is important, but it's not as important, which is strange because now there are businesses today doing exactly that, and they're not looking about the web on the web. Yeah, but that, that's the way it is. Okay, cool. Um, so that kind of takes us to um, um, how you guys uh, maintain the service or deliver the service to your customers. So um, I guess the m most interesting thing that at least I had in mind is um, you talked about. Um, Quite a few servers, right? About 200. Yeah. And a lot of modules. I guess you have the um, what do you call it? the viewing module where people get the, the sites, but you also have the editing. Yeah. Uh, modules. Um, so can you describe a bit about your development practices and how you maintain the service, how you upgrade the services? Ooh, well, that's a big question. Well, there are, there are a few factors in that, in that question. One thing. Wix, when we started, it started like a traditional Israeli startup that you have one server that, is, that does everything. It's the God server, and that God server has a lot of features, and we develop very, very fast. And you get to a point that you can develop anything, you can deploy anything, and it does, just doesn't work anymore. And that's probably the, the yeah, original the way. It just doesn't, uh, doesn't cut anymore. The development doesn't scale. It's not that 
the solution doesn't scale. So what happens we had we had a realization that this is not the way to build software. The way to build software is to go with what was called continuous delivery, continuous integration, continuous delivery, test driven, but mostly continuous delivery. And also we to go to what you can call service oriented, not in the web service traditional way, not with the in service oriented in a way in that you break your application to different services that collaborate and together give they give they create the service that you have, that you provide your customers. Okay. Yeah, would you you know there actually was a name for it some something like ten years ago, something like called collaborative computing. Was before it, there was the name SOA mm-hmm. in for the Wales uh, web services. And and they collaborate through well-defined web interfaces and yeah. not via sharing the same database, for example, right? Just my web interface. So today what we're using is a, a JSON, JSON mm-hmm. RPC, uh, using a, the Jackson library. Sure. Actually, I've seen, I've seen a benchmark that Jackson is 30% slower than a, a protobuf. And protobuf is the fastest thing we can use. Mm-hmm. And it's about don't know how many times faster than XML uh, and a lot of other binary protocols and stuff. So it's, sure. it's very fairly efficient. Yeah, efficient. Now, the reason is actually not efficiency. The reason is the decoupling. The problem with software is we, not, we, talk, we talk a lot about the system architecture, uh, what types of services do I have, what are installed, and who talks with whom. We forget that we also have a build architecture. How we, cre- how we take a line of code from the desktop, the, the developer's desktop, and bring that to production. And what are the dependencies that we have to go through all the way? And what we have to deploy when we want to deploy this one line of code? So if I have to restart my whole service just to deploy one line of code, there's probably something wrong with what I'm doing. And if I have to stop my service for any reason that I'm probably doing something wrong. If I have to deploy once in two, three, four months, what will happen is that once I try to deploy something, I'll fail. Everyone knows that when you have a release, first thing you're doing is you're basically bringing all your stuff to the office, order a lot of pizza and beer, and stay in the office for a few weeks until that, some, that something works. Yeah. Well, so something is, mm, that, it does scale. Yeah. Continuous delivery means that I can de- I deploy when I check in the code to my version control system. I can do something like, today in weeks we're doing probably something like two, three, four releases a day. I've seen companies do over 50 a day. And in order to get that, you need to do, to do a dramatic a very dramatic uh, shift in the way we work. First of all, we have to rely on automation to automate everything that we can, testing and deployment to production, and to bring to get a service and have a new version of that service up and running should be something automatic. It means you have to be back and forward compatible. Back backward compatible because you want to deploy just one service and it has to be backward compatible with everything else. Sure. Forward compatible is because you deployed one service, you deploy the second service, and then you roll back to the first service. So you need to do backward compatible. You need to move forward compatible. So you need to control your compatibility. You need to have the, the, all of your interfaces to be well defined and to make sure that if you have something, let's say, something extra or something missing, you need to, to be able to cope with that. You need to, uh, another practice that is used is called feature tagging. And that means that I'm creating something new. And I'm sure that any operations, any people from operations, when they would they, they would tell them, when you deploy your system, you will have random code that the developers are working on and never tested in your production environment. I guess people would freak out. So the way to cover that is to have a feature toggle, which basically I'm creating something new, I can create a toggle which is best says whether that new functionality works or not. The developer is responsible that when he checks in code, that code is, doesn't break anything. And we have lots of tests that which ensure that. 
and it, it's the developer's responsibility to do that. And when you produce the feature, when we also have to production and we, would, and we want new code to not be functional, either we won't use it, won't have anything that uses it, and if we do, we'll have a toggle that turns it off. So that until, let's say, let, let's, let, let's, let's support an example. Let's say I have a, let's say I have my uh, billing service and I have my shop service. And my billing service now, up until now, supported uh, just, let's say, just uh, Visa credit cards. And now it has to support local credit cards of different countries. So now it has to get more information about the credit card from the, the checkout process. And so we can each change the service, we can change the interface between the, those two components. Traditionally, what we do, we would deploy those two versions together. But that's a, a problem because, first of all, I don't want to schedule the real estate. I want when something ready to draw it out. Not always going to be ready first. I don't care. I want when something ready, draw it out and to be to ensure that it works with the older version of the second. Then with the second, whatever. So when I build the, I can say the checkout process, and in the checkout process. I am not sure whether the billing will be first or not, but I get the sense that the checkout is going to, to be deployed first. I would have a feature toggle. Do I want to show the option to select local credit cards or not? As long as I haven't deployed the new version of the, uh, of the billing pre process or billing service, I would turn it off. But it's still there in production. Once I deploy the, my new billing server, and it will go through self-test that nothing I haven't talked about and I'm sure and I've done the deployment process data and I'm sure that it's fine I can open that toggle and check out that everything worked together I don't need to have to try and do a, a staging environment where I'm trying to bring those to services try to check to working together it's actually counterproductive sure and I guess it's a lot. It's, there's, I can talk about it for probably for a week. So there's a lot of stuff there. Okay, so let, let's start to touch a bit about, um, I guess once you have things rolling in the production and, and you know, stuff is up and running, uh, you obviously need to monitor it, right? To yeah. make sure everything is running properly and you know, mm -hmm. probably define your metrics and SLAs. Um, so could you describe the process you guys went through to define those SLAs and how that affected uh, you know, the way you work, your architecture maybe? Well, I can talk about two things here. <coughs> I think first thing is, to, to, is that one thing that you understood very fast is we have two different SLAs in works. We have a part that sells websites. We have over 15, 16 million websites now. And we have part about building websites. And the part that were well, actually the problem with the SLAs that we had was a bit unconventional. It was about deployment. We needed to deploy a lot more versions in the editing area compared to the viewing area. But when those two parts were together, when we deployed a version in the editing area of the editing subsystem, with downtime was also of the public subsystem, which serves the website. So, obviously something is wrong with that architecture. So we understood that we had to split architecture in two with a very well-defined interface in the middle. We have an editing segment and a public segment that sells the website. The public segment, the separation is first and foremost so that when we touch something that is not serving websites, we have no risk in the public segment. It just works. So that's one way architecture was impacted by SLA. <coughs> I think we're talking about monitoring. Another thing we understood is that monitoring is out. Now monitoring is out because first of all, we don't really know to monitor stuff as an industry. We know to monitor CPU, we know to monitor memory, JVM memory and all kinds of stuff. But who cares about that? We know to look at slogs, which are always